My name is Rick Renner. Today I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia, seated on the banks of the Neva River. And just across the Neva is the Winter Palace and the Hermitage Museum, which has a marvelous armor collection with more than 15,000 pieces in its collection. The collection was started by the Emperor Alexander I. It was added to by subsequent emperors. It's marvelous and it is enormous. So many weapons. But why this fixation on weapons? Because there's an enemy. We have an enemy as well. He's called the devil. And when you come to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul, by divine revelation, begins to describe how the enemy's forces are militarily aligned against us. We need to know about our enemy just as any nation needs to understand their enemy and how their enemy operates. When you are ignorant of your enemy, you're in trouble. But there's no reason for us to be ignorant about the devil because the Bible tells us all about him, even how his troops are marshaled against us. All of that is in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. Today we're going to jump right back into Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking at the spiritual weaponry which God has given to you and to me. My friends, God has made sure that we are dressed to kill. He's given us all the spiritual weaponry we need to keep the devil under our feet. And today is going to be good because today we're going to see how the devil is militarily arranged against us. The Bible is very explicit because we need to know who we are up against. And my friends, we have everything we need to keep him under our feet, but we need to know what the Bible says about him. So today we're going to really focus on Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. It's going to be powerful and full of divine revelation. But hey, if you're not a partner, please pray about joining us as a partner. And the moment you join our partner family, we're going to send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. It may look small, but it is powerful. This book will help you walk free from any prison of unforgiveness that you were in as you give the gift of forgiveness to those who have offended or those who have hurt you. Anyway, we'll send this to you the moment you become a partner and we'll also send you my book, which is called Life in the Combat Zone, How to Survive, Thrive and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. And this book is dedicated to our partners. So the moment you become a partner, we get it right to you as our way of saying, welcome to our partner family. And together, as partners, we take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the earth. And right now we're offering you my brand new series, which is called Dress to Kill. I've never taught this whole series like this before. It's very intense. It is very in-depth. The whole series says you don't have to take it anymore because you are dressed to kill a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats and it comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you my book by the same title called Dress to Kill. The back of the book says Dress to Kill is a classic defining work on the subject of biblical spiritual warfare. In this book, Rick presents a scripturally sound strategic approach to thwart every onslaught of spiritual wickedness that ever tries to come against your life. We need to know what the Bible says about the devil, what the Bible says, not what someone else says. We need to base what we believe on the Bible. And the Bible is very clear that we are in a winning position. We're not trying to get the victory. Jesus already got the victory. Now God has given us weaponry to enforce that victory. And that is what this book, Dress to Kill, is about. And I want you to get your copy today. And if you need prayer, please remember that we are here for you. We want to hear from you. We want to pray for you. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things. And we believe that in this ministry. And if you'll send us your email or give us a call, we will call out to God in faith with you and believe that he will show you great 
and mighty things. We want to pray for you. So please contact us right now. But hey, reach for your Bible. And today we're going to return to Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul begins an entire text on the subject of spiritual weaponry. I have my Bible. I hope that you have yours. So let's go there. Ephesians chapter 6, and let's review verse 10 and verse 11. And in verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We've seen that that word finally really means now to the last and most important matter at hand. I've saved the most important thing to the end of the text. So if you don't remember anything else, this will stand out in your mind now to the last and most important matter at hand. Finally, my brethren. He even calls them brethren from the Greek word adelphos, which really was the word popularized to carry the idea of a comrade, or a fellow fighter. He's calling them comrades, fellow fighters. Finally, my fellow fighters, finally my comrades, be strong in the Lord. We've seen that this word strong is the Greek word in dunamao. It's a compound of two words, the word en, which means to put something into something like a vessel or a container or a receptacle. The second part of the word is dunamis, which describes a force of nature like a hurricane, a tornado, an earthquake, or even the full force of an invading army. But all of that amazing power is in, placed into some kind of a vessel or container. And that's where we come into the picture. God made us. He fashioned us to hold his divine power, which means God's power is not a free floating power that just drifts in the universe, but God made his power to be placed inside you and me. We are fashioned to be the containers for this supernatural power. And when it comes in us, it transforms us into superhuman people with superhuman abilities. That's what happens when we receive a fresh touch of God's power. And it goes on to say, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then if you would look at verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God, the Greek word panoplia, included seven pieces of weaponry, which we're going to begin seeing in Monday's program. But it says, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's a devil out there, and he is against us. And when we are dressed in the whole armor of God, we are able to stand against him. We're no longer running from him. We are in pursuit of him. We can push him back across the line and say, excuse me, this is my territory and you are not allowed here. And the weapons of our warfare described in Ephesians chapter 6 gives us the confidence, the power, and the ability to push the devil back across the line. But wait. Then you come to Ephesians 6, verse 12, where Paul begins to speak by divine revelation, and he describes how the devil's power is arranged militarily. Notice what he says in Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. But notice in the very first, verse 12, he uses the word wrestle. And because it is the word wrestle in English, we think of two men that are wrestling on a mat. That is not what you read in the Greek text. The Greek word that is used here is the word pale. And what is interesting it is the only time this word is ever used in the New Testament. This is the only time it is ever used. So Paul used it for a very special purpose because he's trying to convey a real strong image to us about spiritual warfare. This word wrestle in Greek is the word pale. And listen to what it means. It describes a struggling, wrestling, or a hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It is most importantly the very Greek word to describe the palestra. Do you hear the connection? Pale, palestra. And the palestra was a famous house of combat sport. And there was a palestra in every major Greek and Roman city. Now, in every major Greek and Roman city, there were all kinds of athletic uh, facilities. One was a gymnasium. Regular competitors went into the gymnasium, but next to the gymnasium was the palestra, and only the most serious competitors went into the palestra, and that is the word that is used in this verse, translated wrestle, but in fact it is the Greek word 
poly. Well, let me tell you about the palestra because that's what Paul is referring to in this verse. It was called the house of combat sports, the house of conflict. And there were primarily three kinds of athletes that competed in the palestra, only three. First, there were boxers. Secondly, there were wrestlers. And third, there was a sport called pancration. Ay, 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 pancration was horrible. Actually, all three of these were violent. For example, wrestling. Well, when we think of wrestlers, we usually think of two men that are just wrestling on a mat. But not in the Greek world. Those wrestlers who competed in the palestra fought very often to the death. There were no, nearly no rules to the game, and there were no rounds. You just fought and fought and fought until one survived and until one was defeated and often until your opponent was dead. That is how they wrestled. They got behind each other, threw them up in the air, grabbed them, broke their backs, broke their fingers, gouged out their eyes. Wrestling was a back-snapping event. Then there were boxers. And the boxers were not like the boxers which we have in the world today. Their boxers wore gloves that were ribbed with steel and with nails that were serrated like the blade of a hunting knife. When you boxed someone with those gloves, you left them a bloody mess. That is why very often when you look at the ancient Greek vases of the Greeks, where it portrays boxers, you see their nose is missing, their ear is missing, blood is pouring from their face because they have been boxed with gloves that have nails serrated like the blade of a hunting knife. And very few boxers retired. Most of them died in the fight. It was a horrific sport. Then there was pancration. Ay, from the word pan, which means all, and the word kratos, which is the word for power. When you put the two words together, a pancrates or pancration, this was the men who claimed to have more power, more might than all the rest. And in fact, these were the survivors of the wrestling match, the survivors of the boxing match. And when they came into the ring, they bit, they gouged, they tore, they broke. There were no rules to the game. They were out to prove who was the fittest of all. This really was survival of the fittest. Now, if you read the King James Version, which says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, you just see in your mind two men wrestling on a match. That is not what the readers in the New Testament saw. They saw the word pale. They all knew this word because the palestra was famous. It was renowned in all of their cities. Everyone knew about the notorious athletes who fought and competed in the palestra. In the palestra, there were back snapping, eye gouging, blood spilling events. And that is the word that Paul used in this verse. Now today, if I was going to describe football to you, I wouldn't have to stop and explain to you what is football because you've grown up in a world of football and you already know what is football. Well, when Paul's readers saw this word wrestle, the Greek word poly, he didn't have to stop and explain everything I've just told you because they grew up in a world where the palestra was very famous. They all knew about the deeds and the activities that took place inside the palestra. And when they saw this word wrestle, the Greek word poly, they understood Paul was alerting them to the fact that spiritual warfare was very, very intense. That's what he's saying in this verse. But wait, then he goes on. And listen to what he says next. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places, where Paul identifies four categories of evil that we are fighting against. First, he says principalities. Second, he says powers. Then he says rulers of the darkness of this world. And last, spiritual wickedness in high places. But there's something else in verse 12 that is very important. He repeats the word against in connection with these evil forces for 
times. That's important because in Greek, he only needed to do it once unless he was really trying to emphasize a point. This point is so important. Paul repeated the word against four times in one verse. Now, normally we would assume the word against would be the word anti, which means against. But in this verse, it's not the word anti, it's the word pros, P-R-O-S. The word pros describes a close confrontation, a face-to-face encounter, something that is intimate. And in fact, this word pros used in this verse is the very word used in John chapter 1, verse 1, to describe the relationship between God the Father and Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That word with is the same word, the Greek word pros. And it describes an intimate relationship between God the Father and God the Son. They were so intimate, they were so close, they could nearly feel each other's breath breathing upon each other's face. It is the picture of intimacy between members of the Godhead. And now that word pros, which describes very intimate contact, is now used in Ephesians 6 verse 12 to tell us spiritual warfare is not what happens to people on the mission field or to people on the other side of the city or on the other side of the world. It's going to happen to you at some point in your spiritual walk. He says, we are against pros face-to-face with principalities, face-to-face with powers, ribcage to ribcage with powers. We are against, he says, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And all four times he uses the word pros to tell us we at some moment are going to have a face-to-face encounter with evil that has been marshaled against us. Now, this should not scare us because the greater one lives inside you and me. He's right here. That's what we're told in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. The greater one lives in us, but we need to know who we're up against. And in this verse, some scholars say that the Apostle Paul begins to use military language, military language. For example, the word principalities. This is the Greek word archos, which symbolically denotes something very, very ancient, something from the very beginning of time or something that was original. It was also used to depict individuals who held the highest and loftiest positions of rank and authority. It is the very word for princes or principalities. And by using this word archos, Paul tells us at the very top of Satan's domain, there's a group of ruling demon spirits like princes or principalities, and they've held their lofty positions of power since ancient, ancient times. And then directly under them, he says there are powers. The word powers is a translation of the Greek word exousias, which describes delegated authority, those that have influence, those that have received authority to do what they wish to do. It denotes those who yield authority that has been entrusted to them by their supervisors. So now we find At the very top of Satan's domain, there's a group of ruling spirits called principalities. Under them, a second category called powers who have received license. They've received authority. They're like roaming spirits about the earth doing what they want to do, but they've received delegated power from the principalities and powers to do it. And then he mentions rulers of the darkness of this world. What in the world does that mean? Well, in Greek, it is the word kosmokrater. It's a compound of two words. The word cosmos, the word cosmos describes something that is ordered or something that is arranged. The word kratos from the word kratos, it's the word for power. But when you compound the two words together, rulers of the darkness of this world in Greek, kosmokrater describes powers that have been organized, powers that have been disciplined, or powers that have been arranged. And it was the very word used to describe a military boot camp. This could be a military word. Well, what happens in a military boot camp? Young soldiers are brought into the camp, and when they come into the camp, they are raw power But that power is not harnessed. In that military boot camp, they are harnessed. They are arranged. They are organized. And all the raw power becomes an organized force. And now the Apostle Paul uses that word to tell us how serious the devil is about victimizing the human race. He takes demon spirits, which are like raw, evil power. He harnesses them. He organizes them. And he sends them forth 
like troops. This shows us the dedication of the devil to take down the human race and to victimize you and to try to victimize me. You know, one time many years ago, I said to the Lord, why does it seem the devil has so many victories? If we have more authority than the devil, if we have more power than the devil, if the greater one lives in us, why does it seem the devil has so many victories? And the Holy Spirit said, because the devil has something the church doesn't have. I said, well, what is that? If we have more power, more authority, and the greater one lives in us, what does the devil have that the church doesn't have? And the Holy Spirit said, the devil has commitment, organization, and discipline. Well, think about it. Today, the average Christian goes to church one time a month. The problem is not power. The problem is not authority. The problem is not that the greater one does not live in us because he does. The problem is the church lacks commitment, organization, and discipline. And we are up against an enemy that is very committed, very organized, and very disciplined. And once these demonic troops have been trained, they are dispatched. And that brings us to the next category, which describes spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wickedness is really the Greek word poneria, which describes destruction, disaster, harm, or danger. So we find that these evil spirits are filled with destruction, damage, harm, disaster. It depicts that which is malicious or malignant. Ay, ay, ay. It was the very word used to depict animals that were savage, wild, vicious, and dangerous. So now Paul tells us once demon spirits' powers have been harnessed and arranged, they are dispatched into the atmosphere. Some people get confused because it says spiritual wickedness in high places. But in Greek, the word high places describes the air below the mountaintops. It's right into our atmosphere. Satan sends these evil spirits, these forces into our atmosphere where they can affect human beings. But when you come to Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul says, first of all, we wrestle, the Greek word pale, which means this is going to be an intense conflict. He's not trying to scare us. He's trying to prepare us. We need to get ready for this because at some point it's going to come to us. That's why Paul uses the word against pros four times in this verse. We're going to have an eyeball to eyeball upfront confrontation with evil at some point that's going to be marshaled against us. And then Paul says specifically, it is against principalities, high-ranking demon spirits, which have delegated authority to powers that roam about the earth doing what they want to do, rulers of the darkness of this world, evil forces that have been harnessed and dispatched into the lower regions of the air where they are savage, they are vicious, they are filled with destruction, and their intent is to harm and to injure the human race. But God gave us weapons to stand against this. And he didn't give us Ephesians 6, verse 12, to scare us, but to inform us. This is a divine revelation alerting us to the fact that the devil is very serious, and we better be serious too. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. The devil is real, and as long as you seek to live in God's will, obey his word, and drive back the forces of darkness, the devil will do his best to oppose and thwart the plan that God wants to accomplish through you. But God has given you everything you need to victoriously stand against the devil and to thwart his attacks. That's right. God has provided you with a complete set of spiritual armor that will put the devil on the run every time. With that weaponry at your disposal, you are dressed to kill. In the in-depth 10-part series, Dressed to Kill, Rick Renner covers the power needed to sustain you through any battle, the seven weapons God has provided for you to use against the enemy, the way to stand victoriously against the wiles of the devil, the God-given strategy to keep the devil under your feet, and so much more. This powerful, life-changing 10-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. You can also order Rick's companion book on spiritual armor and spiritual warfare called Dress to Kill. This fully illustrated 500-page book will answer your questions about the often misunderstood subject of spiritual warfare. It will teach you how to put on the full armor of God, 
and the important role each piece of armor plays in defeating the enemy. This powerful classic on spiritual warfare and spiritual armor can be yours for just $22. Don't miss this special offer, this series, Dress to Kill, and Rick's companion book, Dress to Kill. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your help is helping us change the lives of people all around the world, especially the street kids of Moscow. Moscow is home to over 20 million people and many children with special needs, but especially children who live on the streets. Because of our partners, we're able to help assist the House of Mercy impact homeless children. House of Mercy is a foster home that has rescued hundreds of children from the streets or from other bad situations and has given them a new chance at life. One of these children is Vita. He was abandoned as a toddler and was raised by dogs until he was rescued by the House of Mercy. Some call this the Mowgli Syndrome, a name taken from the character from the classic jungle book story. Because of your gift and the work we are doing at the House of Mercy, Vita is now a healthy child. He is going to school, is being restored after receiving spiritual, emotional, and physical care by the House of Mercy. This is just one story of how the House of Mercy has helped hundreds of children reclaim their lives and fulfill their destinies. This is all possible due to the partners who support our work. Will you consider becoming a partner so that we can continue changing other homeless children's lives like Vita? There are so many more children who need the help of the House of Mercy. Will you show them your care today by giving a gift of any size? When you give, you show the love of Jesus to these precious children. Right now, right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner in this important work. Please call or go to renner.org to make a donation of any amount. Your financial support is helping us change the lives of children, children just like Vita. This week, we have covered Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 12. There is no way you can remember everything that I've been sharing with you this week, and that's why I want you to order the whole series, which is called Dress to Kill. You don't have to take it anymore. You are dressed to kill a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor. My friend, you need to hear this and hear this and hear this. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats, and it comes with a study guide. You can hear it. You can see it. You can read it. This will just equip you for the battle. And we're offering you my book, which is called Dress to Kill, by the same title. You don't have to take it anymore. You're Dress to Kill, a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor. My friend, you need a biblical approach, and that's why I have written this book for you. You're not a victim. God's given you everything you need to be dressed, to kill, to deal with any enemy that ever comes against you. And this book will help you order yours today. And remember that if you need prayer, we are here for you. And we want to hear from you so we can begin to pray for you. And I speak the life of God over you in Jesus' name. My friend, the power of God is yours. Take it. It's yours. Let it equip you today. And I'll see you on Monday. Until then, remember... Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.